verses 7 to 14. The former objection is repeated and prosecuted, v 7, 8, for proud hearts will hardly be beaten out of their refuge of lies, but will hold fast the deceit. But his setting off the objection in its own colors is sufficient to answer it, if the truth of God has more abounded through my lie. He supposes the sophisters to follow their objection thus, if my lie, that is, my sin, for there is something of a lie in every sin, especially in the sins of professors, have occasioned the glorifying of God's truth and faithfulness, why should I be judged and condemned as a sinner, and not rather thence take encouragement to go on in my sin, that grace may abound. An inference which at first sight appears too black to be argued, and fit to be cast out with abhorrence. Daring sinners take occasion to boast in mischief, because the goodness of God endures continually. Let us do evil that good may come is oftener in the heart than in the mouth of sinners, so justifying themselves in their wicked ways. Mentioning this wicked thought, he observes, in a parenthesis, that there were those who charged such doctrines as this upon Paul and his fellow ministers, some affirm that we say so. It is no new thing for the best of God's people and ministers to be charged with holding and teaching such things as they do most detest and abhor, and it is not to be thought strange, when our master himself was said to be in league with Beelzebub. Many have been reproached as if they had said that the contrary of which they maintain, it is an old artifice of Satan thus to cast dirt upon Christ's ministers, for it air calumniary, alakid ad harabi I slander thickly on, for some will be sure to stick. The best men and the best truths are subject to slander. Bishop Sanderson makes a further remark upon this, as we are slanderously reported blasphemometha. Blasphemy in scripture usually signifies the highest degree of slander, speaking ill of God. The slander of a minister and his regular doctrine is a more than ordinary slander, it is a kind of blasphemy, not for his person's sake, but for his calling's sake and his work's sake. Answer. He says no more by way of confutation but that, whatever they themselves may argue, the damnation of those is just. Some understand it of the slanderers, God will justly condemn those who unjustly condemn his truth. Or, rather, it is to be applied to those who embolden themselves in sin under a pretense of God's getting glory to himself out of it. Those who deliberately do evil that good may come of it will be so far from escaping, under the shelter of that excuse, that it will rather justify their damnation, and render them the more inexcusable, for sinning upon such a surmise, and in such a confidence, argues a great deal both of the wit and of the will in the sin a wicked will deliberately to choose the evil, and a wicked wit to palliate it with the pretense of good arising from it. Therefore their damnation is just, and, whatever excuses of this kind they may now please themselves with, they will none of them stand good in the great day, but God will be justified in his proceedings, and all flesh, even the proud flesh that now lifts up itself against him, shall be silent before him. Some think Paul herein refers to the approaching ruin of the Jewish church and nation, which their obstinacy and self-justification in their unbelief hastened upon them apace. Paul, having removed these objections, next revives his assertion of the general guilt and corruption of mankind in common, both of Jews and Gentiles, v. 918. Are we better than they, we Jews, to whom were committed the oracles of God? Does this recommend us to God? or will this justify us? No, by no means. Or, are we Christians, Jews and Gentiles, so much better antecedently than the unbelieving part as to have merited God's grace? Alas! No, before free grace made the difference, those of us that had been Jews and those that had been Gentiles were all alike corrupted. They are all under our sin. Under the guilt of sin, under it is under a sentence, under it is under a bond by which they are bound over to eternal ruin and damnation, under it is under a burden, ps 38 4, that will sink them to the lowest hell, we are guilty before God. Under the government and dominion of sin, under it is under a tyrant and cruel taskmaster, enslaved to it, under it is under a yoke, under the power of it, sold to work wickedness. And this he had proved, pro Tiasamatha. It is a law term, we have charged them with it, and have made good our charge, we have proved the indictment, we have convicted them by the notorious evidence of the fact. 
This charge and conviction he here further illustrates by several scriptures out of the Old Testament, which describe the corrupt depraved state of all men, till grave restrain or change them, so that herein as in a glass we may all of us behold our natural face. Which are repeated as containing a very weighty truth, PS 53 1-3. The rest that follows here is found in the Septuagint translation of the 14th Psalm, which some think the Apostle chooses to follow as better known, but I rather think that Paul took these passages from other places of scripture here referred to, but in later copies of the Septuagint they were all added in PS 14 from this discourse of Paul. It is observable that, to prove the general corruption of nature, he quotes some scriptures which speak of the particular corruptions of particular persons, as of Dog. PS 140,3, of the Jews, ISA 59,7, 8, which shows that the same sins that are committed by one are in the nature of all. The times of David and Isaiah were some of the better times, and yet to their days he refers. What is said PS 14 is expressly spoken of all the children of men, and that upon a particular view and inspection made by God himself. The Lord looked down, as upon the old world, General 6 5. And this judgment of God was according to truth. He who, when he himself had made all, looked upon everything that he had made, and behold all was very good, now that man had marred all, looked, and behold all was very bad. Let us take a view of the particulars. An habitual defect of everything that is good. One there is none righteous, none that has an honest good principle of virtue, or is governed by such a principle, none that retains anything of that image of God, consisting in righteousness, wherein man was created, no, not one, implying that, if there had been but one, God would have found him out. When all the world was corrupt, God had his eye upon one righteous Noah. Even those who through grace are justified and sanctified were none of them righteous by nature. No righteousness is born with us. The man after God's own heart owns himself conceived in sin. There is none that understandeth, v. 11. The fault lies in the corruption of the understanding, that is blinded, depraved, perverted. Religion and righteousness have so much reason on their side that if people had but any understanding they would be better and do better. But they do not understand. Sinners are fools. None that seeketh after God, that is, none that has any regard to God, any desire after him. Those may justly be reckoned to have no understanding that do not seek after God. The carnal mind is so far from seeking after God that really it is enmity against him. They are together become unprofitable, v 12. Those that have forsaken God soon grow good for nothing, useless burdens of the earth. Those that are in a state of sin are the most unprofitable creatures under the sun, for it follows. There is none that doeth good, no, not a just man upon the earth, that doeth good, and sinneth not, Ecl 7.23. Even in those actions of sinners that have some goodness in them there is a fundamental error in the principle and end, so that it may be said, there is none that doeth good. Malum oritur exquilibet defect very defect is the source of evil. An habitual defection to everything that is evil, they are all gone out of the way. No wonder that those miss the right way who do not seek after God, the highest end. God made man in the way, set him in right, but he hath forsaken it. The corruption of mankind is an apostasy. That which is actual. And what good can be expected from such a degenerate race? He instances. In their words, v 13, 14, in three things particularly. Cruelty, their throat is an open sepulchre ready to swallow up the poor and innocent, waiting an opportunity to do mischief, like the old serpent seeking to devour, whose name is Abaddon and Apollyon, the destroyer. And when they do not openly avow this cruelty, and vent it publicly, yet they are underhand intending mischief, the poison of asps is under their lips, JAM 3 8, the most venomous and incurable poison, with which they blast the good name of their neighbor by reproaches, and aim at his life by false witness. Cheating, with their tongues they have used deceit. Herein they show themselves the devil's children, for he is a liar, and the father of lies. They have used it, it intimates that they make a trade of lying, it is their constant practice, 
especially belying the ways and people of God. Cursing, reflecting upon God, and blaspheming his holy name, wishing evil to their brethren, their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. This is mentioned as one of the great sins of the tongue, JAM 3 colon 9. But those that thus love cursing shall have enough of it, PS 109 colon 17 19. How many, who are called Christians, do by these sin events that they are still under the reign and dominion of sin, still in the condition that they were born in? Thank you.